Fantastic. My name is Natasha Kimani. Um, I am Kenyan from the most beautiful city on the continent, Nairobi. It is my ultimate pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, I work with an organization known as Africa No Filter, and it is my singular honor today to moderate this phenomenal panel. Um, and you will agree with me that my amazing panelists need no introduction, but because there are some people who may have the misfortune of not knowing who they are, I'm going to do a small introduction um, and welcome. So I'm going to begin on my immediate right, my far right, Jennifer Makumbi. Jennifer is a Ugandan fiction writer. Her first novel, Kintu, won the Kwan Yi Manuscript Project in 2013. Her second book, a collection of short stories, Manchester Happened, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, Harper's Bazaar. Her third novel, which is one of my favorite, The First Woman, was published in 2020. Jennifer is the recipient of the Wynham Campbell Literature Prize 2018. She won the Global Commonwealth Short Story Prize 2014 for her short story, Let's Tell This Story Properly, which we'll be discussing today. She was 2022 Artist in Residence of the Berlin Artist in Residence Program of the DAD. She holds a PhD from Lancaster University and has been senior lecturer at several universities in Britain. Welcome, Jennifer. A round of applause. <laughs> to my immediate left is a fantastic Kosi Komla Ebri. Kosi, born in Togo, arrived in Italy in 1974 and is a retired surgeon. He's the author of the short story collection, Home, the novel, Nela, and the reflection, Embracements. Daily embarrassments in black and white and color, which I loved. I urge you all to buy. I think that's my favorite. I really loved it. Um, he was awarded the 2005 Premio Perme Rostrum for Literature and Premio Graphon, Graphene in 2009. The novel Nila won the Patro Prize dedicated to migrant culture in 2019. He's founding member of El Ghibli Online, an online magazine of migration literature. A round of applause. <laughs> Guys, we can do better than that. Thank you, thank you very much. And last but definitely not least, uh, one of the things I love most about Kalaf is his glasses. I feel like it's a signature look. Uh, born in Angola in 1978, writer and musician based in Berlin, published the books Tabem Us, I can't say that it's, uh, please forgive my, my Portuguese, it's, it's very lacking. Um, <laughs> Whites Can Dance Too, which I currently am reading and I am in love with. Um, and uh, the Angolan who bought Lisbon, and member of the band Buraka Som Sistema, multifaceted individual. A round of applause. Just an alert that we are joined by a live audience today. Um, we will be taking in their, co uh, their questions. So welcome to those who are tuning in and watching us from all around the world. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for taking the time to spend with us. And I'm going to begin with you, Kosi. You moved to Italy in 1974. Um, would you say moving to Italy then was much easier than it is now? So, good evening, everybody. I'll try to speak in, uh, in English. Uh, my broken, my scholastic English. So, uh, I came in Italy in 1974. Uh, it's a different Italy, uh, I found, because uh, I went there with a scholarship for the university to study medicine at the University of Bologna. Uh, and, uh, in, in these years, you are not a lot of African people in Italy. So at the university, Bologna is a city particular, is a city of a university. Uh, I remember that when I come in, at Bologna, in the, in the great hall of the university, you have to get faster to have a place to sit down for the relations. 
But you know, with my African time, <laughs> I arrived any time <laughs> late. But I have no to have problem to find a place. Because every time when I arrive, the other used to deserve a place with their, their book. When I arrive, they say, Kosi, come here, come here. Every, every, every time I found place because they want to know me, to speak mm. about Africa. They were, they were, they were uh, curiosity uh, about Africa. So we are uh, uh, intellectual migration. So the people, uh, some of them have uh, parents, uh, missionaries some, somewhere in Africa. So they want to speak with me to know what's the reality of Africa. And Bologna was a city, particular city. You can go to Piazza Maggiore, the, 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 the good place. You speak with, with, with the people. Uh, you need to go somewhere. They, 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 they go with you. Right? To, to, Sometimes I, I, sit, I sit down, I speak people, and I go to, 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 to have a dinner with them. Today in Italy, <laughs> this reality don't exist. Mm -hmm. Today, even you meet someone in the street, you go to ask, he crossed the street not to speak to you. Our, uh, there's today uh, something like an Afrophobia against uh, African people. Uh, we remain, there are also immigrants from Albania, from Rumain Romania, but they were white. If they know they speak Italian, no one can do the difference with Italians. I am black. So I remain all, every time differently diversity, differently visible. So that is, uh, even if I have, if Kili Kili was spaghetti, if I stay there for years and years, I remain diversely, diversely, diversamente visible. Thank you for that. And Jennifer, you are nodding in acknowledgement of what he said. And you're, you're Ugandan, born in Uganda, uh, but you've lived in England for 18 years. Um, before I tie that into what uh, Kosi said, what does it mean, or what did it mean to be Ugandan then? And what does it mean to be Ugandan now? And what has changed? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, when, before I immigrated, before I left Uganda, I took Uganda for granted. I was never proud to be Ugandan. Everything about Uganda was annoying, was embarrassing, and was backward. Um, but uh, of course, and even my identity at that time was not Ugandan, I was just Jennifer. Mm. That was my identity. Um, so, um, like most of probably people who've not left their world, mm -hmm. I took that country for granted until I left. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, okay, this is where I belong. But the problem with immigration is that um, you take that country that you occupied with you and you nurture it and hang on to it and it's this place you're going to go back to. But often, uh, especially for me, when I first went, I didn't have the money mm -hmm. to come back. So you have to save a lot uh, to afford the ticket. And when I came back to Uganda, I was surprised that the country I left behind, the, the one I had nurtured, had moved on. Mm -hmm. Um, the way they spoke, the language, uh, uh, they were just so annoying. I, I kept on thinking, that's not the way we speak. And they said, which we? Um, the, the, uh, the culture itself, uh, and the thing is, it doesn't improve as far as I'm concerned. It gets worse, the language gets worse. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, but at the same time, they had been pushed further away 
from me as well. So I would arrive and my mother would ring my uh, siblings and say, oh God, keep time, the British is here. <laughs> you know, um, and, and the, so they started to put, or, or they would say things like, will you manage this? You see, for us, we, this is, well, but you white people, you know, so they started to call me Mzungu, that, you know, so there's that Uganda that I went back to that was putting me at a distance, but also the, the place, the way the buildings had changed, the behavior had changed, and I was kind of lost in the middle thinking, where is my Uganda that I've been nurturing? So, as someone who's lived in England for 18 years, yes. do you feel lost in between two worlds, or do you now feel more drawn towards one world in particular? No, I don't feel lost in two worlds, but sometimes I want to take a little bit of Britain to Uganda. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. if I could park certain <laughs> things, like Such polite, uh, excuse me, thank you very much, and uh, if I say, where's your manager? I need to speak to your manager. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone would say, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, we are not taking it, you yeah. know. So I, I, there's some politeness that I'm used to in yeah. Britain that I wish I could carry yeah. with me, but Uganda is still home. But um, there are so, so many things I would like to change a little bit. On a light note, as a Kenyan, I'm surprised that you don't find Ugandans polite because <laughs> then I, I, I shudder to think what we are. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, let's say you hosting me, I'm not going to join into that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Kalaf, um, you moved to Portugal from Angola as a teenager. And in your book and in your work, you've had to fight against the misrepresentation of Angolans, Angolan culture, Angolan music. How has that been and does it take a toll on you at some point? That not only are you trying to fit into a particular country, but now you, the onus is upon you to shift people's harmful narratives. Hello. Uh it's nice to be here. Thank you, you guys, for coming. Uh, no, uh, Angolans, we are, we are very confident. We think we are the best. I love that. <laughs> we are the most stylish. We have the better music. Agreed. As you can see, so sorry, let me stand up. <laughs> I appreciate, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's not our problem if people don't catch with us, it's their problem. That's how we see it, that's how we feel it. So if we are in a new place, if it's only one of us, we will make sure that people feel our presence. And if it's the two of us, uh, we definitely will take over, yeah. Some people say we are the Nigerians of the South. Nigeria, uh, Jennifer agrees with that. Uh, <laughs> so in Portugal, we definitely um, were there. There were phases, yeah. Like the f in the eighties, that's what the the, f the first migrants, I would say, the first um, war uh, migrants, yeah, that left the country because of the civil war. Before that was the. Um, 75 independence, um, so the people that, um, well, say, in Portugal they, they call them uh, the returnees, mostly white Angolans, or, you know, some identify as Angolans, but mostly Portuguese uh, ex -colon colonizers that left. And they somehow brought. Angolan identity into Portugal. So when, when the first uh, wave of Angola, visible Angolans, people that can be recognized in the street as Angolans, when they arrived in the 80s, it, it was just a matter of time until we, we took over. And matter of fact, I'm kind of joking, but I'm telling the truth. Matter of fact, when we approached the 2000s, came the, 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 let's say, the third wave of Angolans, mostly uh, 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 
the generals and the sons and the daughters of the generals, and they bought everything. So that title of my book, The Angolan Who Bought Lisbon, is a reflection of that reality because the, the country was bankrupt because of the, the, the Portuguese, uh, no, the, it was part of the pigs, you know, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Uh, so Angolans took a, an opportunity and just bought everything that was available to buy. They went after the national TV station, they went after the, the um, air race, absolutely serious. They went after the banks, the, the insurance companies, and everything. They were even, you know, doing something. Later, like recently, uh, um, I met one of those millionaires that were buying the countries. And I say, oh, do you realize that in the press, people were saying that you were doing um, reverse colonialism? And he said, yes, we, uh, I was aware of that sentence, and that was actually the plan. We wanted really to take the, the Portugal. Um, funny enough, <laughs> I, I'm not a millionaire. I'm not part of that. But the, this is the Angolan me, you know, saying that to some kind of pride. But it's a bit tragic as well because the country is in despair. Yeah, we, um, to give you an, uh, an example, our former president, um, died, I think, a year ago, two years ago, and he died in Barcelona, for example, because there were not a, an hospital that could treat him. So it was tragic like that. Yeah? So we could buy, we could afford to buy those companies that were bankrupt in Europe, but we couldn't buy, uh, build hospitals to take care of our sick people. So. Um, but there is a, a story that I tell very often, and people ask me why I title my, my book The Angolan Who Bought Lisbon at Half the Price. Because I usually, well, not, not now anymore, but back in the days, um, I was you know, wearing suit and ties everywhere, even to go to buy bread. So in my street, few blocks uh, uh, apart from my home, there was this um, really regular restaurant, very simple, just, you know, like the like working class restaurant that you go and buy it like a $10 meal. I was sitting there having my meal. I, I, I was going there like almost every day. And suddenly comes the owner of the restaurant and asks me, are you Angolan? I say, yes, I'm Angolan. And then he's just go on this pitch about his place. Oh, we just refurbished this uh, kitchen. We just did that. We bought this. We bought that. We bought that. Like just took him into a tour around the restaurant. Like, and like, I, had, I didn't have the courage to say to the to the guy that I'm as poor as you. <laughs> but I went with him. You know, like uh, I was, was just uh, uh, curious where this thing will lead me. I don't know if it was the Angola on me or the writer on me that was just uh, driven by curiosity. Um, and at the end, after he basically explained everything that he wanted to explain, instead of me telling the truth, so sorry, um, I don't have money, I just asked him, how much? <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know if that answer your question, but I think that I need portrays. To know how much? How much was it? Was I couldn't afford to be to be honest, and I didn't really want to own a restaurant, but uh, it, it was just the situation and yeah. the despair of that man. Thank you. One of my take homes is that Kalaf went to buy bread in a suit and tie. Kenyan men cannot relate. It's a different reality, interesting one, and because. I have questions about what we consider home and what home is. I will come back to that. But um, Kosi has said severally in the press when he's interviewed that it is necessary and important for us to deconstruct the negative image that Italy and the world in general has about Africa. Um, one, is it possible for us to do it? Two, if so, how do we go about that monumentous challenge? to create a positive image about Africa and Africans. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. First, we have to, to understand why there is this negative uh, image of uh, Africa. Uh, in Europe, the negative image is born times ago. You know, in the mentality, Africa was uh, where there were the dragons. Uh, after all the stories of uh, slavery, colonialism, neo-colonialism, uh, Africans are seen like less than anything. Uh, they have the, the idea that Africa is like a country, not of a country of 54 countries, not a, uh, <coughs> a continent of 54 countries. More, more 1,200 of languages. Sometimes someone asked me, because he tell me a word in African. So, uh, tell me some, something in European. <laughs> so the idea uh, also uh, was perpetuated by books, mm -hmm. uh, cinema, Tarzan, no? uh, out of Africa. Uh, the, all the films, the, 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 the TV series, but also sometimes NGOs to get money, uh, they give the idea, the images of African children with the noises, you know, with the, the, the bell, uh, berries, yes. Uh, so all this created in the image. So to change, we, we, we need to deconstruct this image of Africa. Mm -hmm. To deconstruct this image, because the image of Africa uh, get out also with the words. Because you know, uh, the words, all of them, we are, uh, we are all artisan, artisan, artists Artist mm -hmm. of the words. A, a writer use the words. Yes. So you know that words are important. You know that every word has behind him an image. If I say uh, snow, I have not to explain. Everyone will see the snow in his image. If I say fire, you have in the, your mind what is fire. So the words are important. Or today they used to, to change the sense of the words when we speak about Africa. No? Or people or, or tribu. No, not the beef. Or tribes. So uh, the people or natives. Or natives. Sometimes I have I, I ask the uh, children at the school who are the natives. They tell me are natives or those of Africa. So so they change the change the, the, the sense also the, 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 of the words. So the image of Africa is uh, so when the um, Someone went in, in Africa yesterday. We said that someone who said, they say, Jumbo. I don't know what's the meaning of Jumbo because he has gone to Malindi he has done <laughs> for one week. So he turned back. You see, every, you see every, every old African, he said, I African Jumbo. <laughs> so all Africans speak Swahili. No? No? So this idea that Africa is one, the, you have to to to, to deconstruct to speak to, to explain that there are more Africans. There's not one uh, Africa. So you, I think that uh, like a writer in our books, in uh, our text, uh, we can uh, give an, an another idea of what is Africa. Or the, the values of our culture. So with our text, we can open mind, open windows on our cultures of uh, uh, nos habitudes. Of our, uh, of our cultures? Yes. Uh, so this this one way, mm -hmm. uh, one way we, we can change the... Uh, I think uh, I personally, uh, I try to 
to, to go to, the, to school, to encounter students, uh, children, children who have not more prejudices. Uh, uh, and I think that with time, uh, the, the, the change ideas about Africa, uh, when the, the, the new person coming from Africa, uh, the, 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 but today, even the government, now in Italy, the new government is trying, is speaking to, uh, against the, the phenomenon of immigration, they were speaking to make a plan, Mate plan for Africa. This is a sort of a Marshall, new Marshall plan for Africa. Everyone wake up in the morning, I make a plan for Africa. No one will plan with Africa. Only plan for Africa. They have to decide for us. Yeah. This, this mentality, this uh, Eurocentrism, to, to think that they, we need them. No. If we need them, uh, now France have good difficulties with West Africa. Mm -hmm. We see every day, that we, they begin to understand that they are happy. Sometimes I, I tell, let's stop helping us. You're helping us for, for, for years, years, we are also set in the same conditions. Perhaps if you stop helping us, we will find a solution to our problems. Jennifer, I'd love to build on the wonderful words of Kosi, especially around words, that words matter. And I'll give a particular example. Every time I see the word sub-Saharan Africa, I want to throw myself against a wall because I often ask, is there a sub-Europe? Why have you decided that this is the only country you will demarcate to suit certain political interests? And one of the things I love about, you know, let's talk about this, let's talk about this properly, is where you say you, you have captured and owned the word expat experiences, when oftentimes Africans are referred to as migrants and immigrants. Was that intentional? And how has that shifted the conversation around what it is to be an African expat? Um, uh, because they own the language still, we haven't shifted it. I could shift it in my book but that is just my book. Um, um, and we've internalized elements of these. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm going to share this with you. I was telling uh, friends of mine, fellow writers yesterday, that we are getting, a, a, you know, in Guru, where Connie was. So a lot of white people have been coming to Guru and helping and um, is, uh, adopting children and doing all sorts of work. So there was a lot of um, um, white people over there and white prostitutes started to fly in into Gulu. They'd get the three months visa, hire a house, print off cards and pass them around. They were experts. Yeah. They were, and they are still experts. I had, oh, well, I have a PhD, and I'm an immigrant in Britain. That is how bad it is. But because it's not our language yet, you know, we haven't shifted it. And we, first of all, we don't hold the pen, we don't hold the camera to, um, to write in the newspapers, but also for the TV. So as long as people are still dying, crossing um, um, to Europe, as long as somebody else is still writing um, this story about immigration, we will always be called immigrants. And here's the thing, while I, I blame the British, I one time go back to Uganda and I went to a place where um, um, 
most people from South Sudan. You see, in Uganda, and I suspect over here in Kenya, but in uh, the border between South Sudan and Uganda is porous. The people, if there are problems there, they just come over. And in the past, they used to be given land and told, given seed and say, build yourself a place, he, get some plant, mm -hmm. whatever. And actually, whenever things got better there, they abandoned the land and went back. But recently I went back to Uganda and I went to a place where South Sudanese used to arrive uh, when I was still in Uganda. And as I walked over, everybody stopped and looked at me. And I noticed, it was like, I'm in Uganda. What, what, what? And then I noticed that they were South Sudanese. At first I thought they were just people from uh, the north. Mm -hmm. Then I noticed they were South Sudanese. And then I walked, nothing. They were just, probably they even pegged me that I'm, I've just arrived from Europe. But uh, when I went and met my sister, I said, there are immigrants over there. And she said, what? I used the word immigrant. Yeah, and, and it, it, sh it didn't make sense. And she said, oh, you mean South Sudanese? Yeah, there are quite a few of them here. But do you see how language can, 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 can twist your mind, even you who is going uh, uh, against it? So for me, um, until we start to tell our stories, in a particular way within Europe uh, that, it, that, 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 that is going to be a problem. But I, w I would like to say a little th thing about um, how do we, um, what, what, what Brother Nkosi was talking about on how to change the attitude about Uganda. Brother Africa, I really don't give a, a hoot what they think of us. I mean, we need to move on. Our ancestors from the, and I'm talking about literary ancestors, they've been telling the world, no, we are not that. We are intelligent. We have an, a, a, a culture. We are this. We, they don't listen. And the people who are sitting in, or who read our books, it's like preaching to the choirs. They are already aware. You know, the world that doesn't want to know what Africa is, doesn't want to know. I think for me, I think we should focus on ourselves. Get rid of that internalization that we are less than them. And teach ourselves that there's so much here we can do. But for goodness sake, what they think of us is none of our business. It's their problem. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Kalaf, do you agree that it's none of our business and... Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Does it matter, though, how we've let their perceptions of us shape who we are? Because that has also been quite harmful. Yeah. I, 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 I love, maybe because of my mother. I'm not good at numbers, but my mother is very good. She was a um, statistic, um, I don't know how to call it that profession, but she was specialized in statistics. And... So every time, you know, those reports comes along, you know, the UN reports and all that, I love to read them. But there's always something there for, for writers, and there's always, you know, uh, a story within the numbers. Um, talking, f for example, you know, in the perspective of the Portuguese speaker in Africa, uh, and uh, connected with language, for example, we now have more or less 34 million in Angola, 33 million in Mozambique, a million in, in, um, um, in Guinea, like half a million in, 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 in um, Cabo Verde. So those are more or less the numbers. Brazil, for example, has uh, almost 200 million, and half of the population in Brazil is non-white. Yes, we yeah, have all shades, but for the sake of the conversation, I will call them black. Yeah. So, 
and a million Brazilians, Afro-Brazilians, black. So those are the numbers that we are dealing with. So when we realize the power of the numbers, yeah, we understand that we are the majority. Yeah? And moving forward, uh, I just released a book in Brazil. Uh, the title is, it's very tough to translate into, into English, but in Portuguese, um, a minha língua é, um, a minha pátria é a língua portuguesa. That more or less is like, um, my land is the broken Portuguese or the black Portuguese, yeah, the way we speak, the way we appropriate the language. When I say that, people laugh. Oh, so funny, like kind of a joke. And this term was actually coined by an um, uh, intellectual and a philosopher in Brazil called Leila uh, Gonzalez. And when, when I speak on, the, on that term and why I emphasize the broken Portuguese that we are using, I look at the reports of UN. And the reports of UN says that in 1,100, yeah, the population in the Portuguese African countries will suppress the Brazilian population. Brazilians will be 190 million, and the Portuguese speaking Africa will be 300 million. So, just to give you a perspective, Portugal has 11 million today. So whose language, whose language is this? Yeah? Believe me, we acclaim it. Yeah? We will call it, whatever we want to call it, this Portuguese. Brazilians, in fact, don't call it Portuguese anymore. For the sake of you know, diplomacy, they call it Portuguese. But most of them call Brazilian. We speak Brazilian. When you go to a school in England, say, I want to learn, they teach you Brazilian. That's the, like most of the people that speaks and learns Portuguese outside of uh, Portugal speaks with the Brazilian accent, with the Brazilian words, the Brazilian uh, terms. A lot of those terms come from Bantu language as well. So that's, that's the language that we are talking. Yeah? So if I believe, and I believe that we'll beat them by the numbers, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, we just need to exercise patience. Yeah, <laughs> right now we are we are dealing with the with the with the you know the let's say the the bad deal that our forefathers had to sign in order to gain our independence. It was a bad deal. They knew it was a bad deal. Yeah, and it's just a matter of time. We will beat them by the numbers. Thank you. It's just a matter of time. I'm going to now open questions, open the floor to questions. Um, oftentimes when you give a Kenyan a mic, they turn it into a comment. Um, if, if you are going to comment, I request that it's short and sweet, but we will welcome questions first. Are we in agreement questions first, comments later? All in agreement say A? Great. Can I have... <laughs> If you have a question, may I please see? I may not be able to see you clearly, but please put your hand up if you have a question for a... Yes. Absolutely, and please let us know who the question is directed to. There's a, there's a hand up there. Thank you very much. Please tell us your name as you ask the question. Um, is there another hand? Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. There are two here at the front. Thank you, I'm so sorry I didn't see that. Thank you, and there's one at the back. So we'll, we'll, we'll take questions from this side first, then we'll move to this side if that's okay. Yes, please, tell us your name. Hello, my name is Sheila, and I'd like to thank everyone for being around. I have a question for all of you having lived outside Africa. Can you trace the inheritance of racism because I was born in 98 and have never left home. I'm Kenyan. But each time anyone speaks on it, I feel really hurt. And so I wonder if there's also someone born in 98 who would be racist towards me. And have you found the line 
where parents pass on this prejudice and heat. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes. But before that, yeah. Jennifer, do you, would you like to take the question? Yes. You want to know whether people born in the same year as you in Europe are still racist? Is that your question? Honey, are you watching the news? <laughs> Leave home or, you know, our parents don't pass on. We are less, you should think of yourself as less. You should always think about leaving home. Your home is not the best. So do European parents actually tell their children that this is what Africa is, this is how Africans are. Do they pass on these, I don't know, colonial mentalisms to, to, their, children to their children as facts? Well, uh, first of all, children, um, young people in Britain and in, in America, I, I can't speak for everywhere else, are less racist now than their parents. And there's always this joke that the white person goes home to dinner, young person, and has to they have to listen to the jokes mother and grandfather makes because, you know, they are stuck in the past. So um, um, there is, um, there is a, a disconnect now. The young generation is less racist. But if we are going to talk about that, um, and forgive me if uh, this doesn't make much sense. I arrive at Jomo Kenyatta Airport, okay? And I'm, I'm queuing up. There are two white people in front of me. And they use their phones to show whatever, visa and whatever. I try, and a fellow black person stops me. So before I talk about racism in Britain or America, let's address the way we still are treating white people <laughs> in our countries. And, and, and this is not to make anybody uncomfortable. But I've found that as some white people leave Europe when they are liberal, they are wonderful people. They come here, and Africans treat them like it's 1944. Uh, 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 like, uh, sir, sir, sir. And they, they actually start to behave in a particular way. They wouldn't. So because I occupy both places, I'm actually more angry with Africans who behave like that. Thank you. Um, and Calif, do you agree that um, you know, young people are less racist uh, now than they were before? Yes, okay. yes, I would say. No, like, but in, in, in many aspects, gender, for example, is a, is, a, is a field where you see young people way more accepting on all the challenges of the modern society. Um, but just to add up, to the young lady that is curious about how Europe is racist uh, you know, today. Racism is a system. Yeah? It's a system that was put in place, perpetuated with centuries and centuries and centuries. Yeah? So even though, even if that young person is not racist, is on a, is, is, it benefits from a racist system. Mm -hmm. yeah? So it's not a question of like uh, how much or less racist you are. You just need to acknowledge that this system needs to be shut down. And what tools or what, what, you, what you're doing in order to break down this system. Yeah? Um, for example, this is the system that still benefits uh, what just, uh, or that emphasize what uh, Jennifer just said, is the system. And we are somehow trapped on that system. We are afraid that we, if we break that system, the world will fall down. Yeah? For example, academia. Yeah? We know that what holds European knowledge are based on lies, like blunt lies, but that they're still there. They didn't took it down, 
all the Kants and all those philosophers, Nietzsche, a bunch of racists. Are we willing to take that down? Because that's the system. Because you, know, you don't apply that just like, oh, I don't like black people. It's deeper than that. Yeah? I love that. It's deeper than that. Um, Calaf is ready to ruffle a lot of feathers today. Um, there's a question there for a gentleman, from the gentleman. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I have two questions. The yes. first is to Jennifer and Kosi. Okay. The second one will be for Calaf. Okay. Uh, to Jennifer and Kosi, your responses to how we push back against misrepresentations of Africa. I always am at a dilemma when reading creatives. How much is the material you're depending on to push back against the narratives of misrepresentation, how much is that figments of your own imagination? Insofar as it is not factual that there is an, you know, an inert Africa existent somewhere that is untouched by external or even colonial influences, if you will. So in other words, there seems to be a campaign to present Africa a particular way but also in that particular way that does not tally with reality, in as far as our reality has been totally distorted by all the influences that we are, we are grappling with. Mm. So we emphasize particular values that harken back to a past that we inhabited, but in fact we exist and cohabit a present that is organized along a different logic, such that when you write to push back against misrepresentation, you write in defense of a past that is not in sync with the present. Then my question to Kalaf, I would like to get more enlightenment on your strategy of patience and that we shall beat them with the numbers. Because when I think about, for example, the tragedy of South Africa, who in their post-liberation era, with a black majority government, and indeed all post-liberation governments across the continent, right here in Kenya, next door in Tanzania, in Uganda, across the continent, even in Angola itself, with the MPLA, even that representation of majority black representation in government has not yielded uh, the sort of hope, strategic hope we had that it would tilt the balance of forces in our favor. And I also don't think that the fact that Brazilians now call Portuguese Brazilian has engendered any strategic advantage to them insofar as how they experience the world. So I'm curious as to how, you know, that patience you are asking us to, to have in as far as our numbers will outgrow those of, uh, of the West and other parts of the world, will in fact translate into a strategic advantage for us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll begin with Kosi, then we'll move to Jennifer, then finally, yes, no worries, please start. I think she's still translating. Oh, where do I start? Um, okay, oh, my mind lets me down. Who was it um, asked me a question? Can you remind me? Just a few words. Oh, oh, okay. Um, we writers um, are not going to deal in reality. Fiction. You know, we we make up these things. But for some reason, the, the world often grows into this myth we make up. So I go into the past, so in Chinto, I went into the past to say to Ugandans, this is where we were, okay? Now, and I skipped the colonial element. And, I, and then I looked at what we were in the present. And I was asking them how many um, strings broke so that what we were in the past is not in the present. How many strings have we kept to who we are now? Nobody, nobody's asking anyone to go back in the past. In fact, that uh, aspect, um, the Afrikenstein in that book, says they cut off the limbs, they cut off the arms and give us white limbs and give us white arms, and we are going to have to learn to walk and walk with white limbs. So uh, um, I'm not asking anybody to bring that reality from the 1700s and impose it on the present. It's, 
it's gone away. We cannot. However, I can suggest, okay? Um, I know for a fact that uh, often these narratives can turn into national narratives and people start to identify according to something that somebody made up. Okay? This is where we contribute. This is where we suggest. So if I write about the future and say, so in one of the books that I'm working on, I'm saying, please, if we are building new cities in Africa, we don't want a New York on the continent. We don't want a London. Oh my God, no, Abu Dhabi, or the, um, um, those were, uh, Eastern new cities. We just want a new, new. Now, if that catches on, okay, because in my book, I've built these new cities, you never know. We are here, we call it Mekondo. This is fictitious. We are living in a, a moment created by somebody in Brazil, in South America, and yet somehow it's here, and we say this is Macondo uh, Literary Festival. So um, we, I don't have to deal with the reality, you know, not in my books anyway. But I can make these suggestions and say, we can do this. Reality is not interesting anyway, and you wouldn't even be interested <laughs> to read it, honestly. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Oui, okay. euh, j'espère j'espère avoir compris un peu la, la, la demande. Euh, bon, moi, je peux dire seulement que ce qu'il faut qu'on évite, c'est d'écrire une Afrique qui n'existe pas. Uh, I'm going to try to respond to the question the best I can. So the first thing is that I hope that uh, we do not write about an Africa that does not exist. C'est-à-dire qu'une image euh, édulcorée, une image inventée d'une Afrique traditionnelle qui n'existe pas. So about an Africa that does not, that is completely golden, that is romanticized, that uh, voilà. exists in the past, that does not exist. Voilà. Parce que la tendance, c'est par exemple quand nous parlons de euh, solidarité africaine, non, il semble que Euh, en Afrique, nous sommes tous seulement solidaires. Euh, les Africains sont tous bons. Euh, ils sont toujours, tous, toujours souriants. Ça, c'est faux. Mm -hmm. That uh, there is a solidarity that exists in Africa. That there is a brotherhood. That uh, that um, that there are links that exist. It is false. It is it is not the truth. Il est vrai que, par exemple, euh, nos vieux ne vont pas encore dans les maisons de repos. It's true that our old are still not going to the old uh, retirement houses. Il est vrai qu'il y a encore le respect pour l'ancien, mais dans un village. It is true that we still respect our old, but in a village. Donc nous ne pouvons pas parler d'une Afrique euh, imaginaire, non, que nous, 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 nous tenons dans, 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 dans nos rêves, tenir compte que les choses, l'Afrique est, est en train de changer. Les choses sont en train de changer. So we cannot hang on to this Africa of the dreams. Uh, Africa is changing. It is changing all the time. Parce que euh, dans l'Afrique traditionnelle que on s'imagine, il n'y aurait pas des enfants abandonnés. Because in the traditional Africa, there would not be abandoned children. L'Afrique traditionnelle que on s'imagine que certains veulent décrire dans 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 dans, dans les livres, euh, c'est la communauté éducante. In this old traditional romanticized Africa, there is all the people are educated. Donc, je pense que on ne peut pas parler de 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 de, de l'Afrique sans tenir compte du changement, que c'est quelque chose qui est en train de changer, hein, et on doit tenir compte du changement qui 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 est en train d'arriver. So we need to take account and we need to write about the Africa that is changing, that is changing all the time, and take account of this change that is happening in Africa. Le problème, c'est de nous poser, nous-mêmes nous poser des problèmes de, 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 de notre part de co-responsabilité de ce que nous voulons faire, nous, de l'Afrique. So here we need to take responsibility 
co-responsibility of the fact that what we want to, how we want to create Africa. Et c'est pour ça que je suis d'accord un peu avec Jennifer que nous perdons beaucoup d'énergie hein, à essayer de, de contenter ce que les Blancs veulent ou ce que l'Europe veut. So here I agree with Jennifer on what she says on the argument that uh, we are responding, we're wasting too much of our energy responding to what the European or the White wants from us. Concentrons-nous à faire ce que nous, nous voulons. We will concentrate on what we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Yeah. Bring back the numbers. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, to, we, we look at Africa, you know, the motherland, the birth of our civilization, yeah, everybody came from here. But this format, this Africa that we are dealing with, that we're still trying to find ways to adapt to, is very recent. Yeah, don't have 60 years, or if it's completing now 60 years um, in terms of independent countries. Yeah, uh, we will celebrate 50 years of independence um, two years from now. 50 years, yeah, it's almost my age. I'm 45. In terms of practicality, this is nothing. Yeah, when I say that our forefathers were gi given a rigged, uh, were invited to play on a rigged game, was true. The cards were marked, yeah? We are paying the prices. If you go and look into those contracts, like oils and stuff, like, they are all 75 years of exploration, yeah? Those contracts are not due yet, yeah? If they decided to, you know, honor those, those deals. Some of our brothers in the continent are saying, enough is enough, we're now cutting down those contracts. We're no longer paying anybody. Niger is the, is the example, yeah? So we are facing a new reality, and we need to, to look that we didn't give ourselves enough time to figure it out. Like, man, someone gave it those frontiers to us, yeah? They were not here. The time that uh, Jennifer is, 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 is pointing, those frontiers didn't exist. That, this Africa didn't exist then. Yeah? And we are dealing with this reality now, and we need to make sense of this. And it's very violent. People are dying because of this nonsense that was designed in Berlin in 1884 and 85. We're still dealing with this bullshit. Sorry, my language. Yeah? So it's very serious. And, and, and again, if you look at Europe, I'm, I'm, I consider myself an expat as well, an African expat in Europe. And I'm observing, like, I saw like, how Spain developed when they joined the European Union. They joined in 80, 85 or something like that, 86, and the money started arriving in the early 90s. And 10 years later, like in early 2000s, like, man, the highways were fantastic. Yeah? The slums were eradicated. Can you imagine Europe with slums? They were there in the 80s. I don't know if there are, there are Europeans here in the room. I don't know if you remember uh, Portugal with slums. They existed. They were there. In certain pockets, you still have it. Yeah? Believe me looks like the slums in Africa as well existed. Yeah? So this is very recent. Like, the, like Europe now is dealing with, the, with, the, with, the, with this wave of fascism. And they're saying, oh, how? You know, 50 years passed, and now we are back, like, uh, going backwards when, when it comes to democracy. That's a reality. That's a real, it, it will happen. Fascism will take over Europe. That's a fact. So, are you afraid of it or you will face it? Yeah, we'll find ways to dismantle, you find ways to bring back 
a sense of a normalcy and a sense of decency how we treat each other. So we didn't give us that time yet as Africans. We didn't give a sense like, you know, to treat each other as brothers. Again, when we see our brothers crossing the borders, for example, I saw Mozambicans crossing the border to South, to South Africa with the other Africans going to South, to South Africa and being beaten to death in the streets like dogs. Yeah, so we didn't give, give ourselves this chance to heal. Imagine like being occupied for sec, uh, centuries and centuries, and suddenly people leave and say, okay, now you deal with it, solve it. And still, your resources are not yours. You need to send your resources still to this, to this uh, continent. We're still dealing with this reality. So when we start shifting this, and the only hope I have in order to shift this is to understand how the world is evolving. How many Africans are being born? How many of us will exist? Because at least that's the only uh, uh, chance that I have is to bet on ourselves. Yeah? Is to bet on the populations of Africans. I saw Asians doing that. Also, Asia was occupied and they solved it because they bet on themselves. So when we start betting on ourselves, and I think Kossi, Jennifer, we all sharing this same knowledge uh, that it's a matter of time. And, and time is not a luxury. Time is all we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to allow the two questions, and you will please, please accept my personal apology. We are well, well over time. You can see people are standing to, to alert that we are past time. I'm really, truly sorry. I know your questions would have been phenomenal. I'll request maybe once we are done, you could come up and uh, give, please just ask your questions. But ladies and gentlemen, it has been my singular honor to moderate this panel. Um, wonderful insights. Some take-homes from me is one, bet on yourself. Bet on yourself as Africans. Believe in yourself and what you can do and be patient. The second one is, why are we spending so much time focusing on what the West thinks about Africa when we should instead be focusing on ourselves? And the final one is words matter. We need to begin using our words as power and weapon to change and shape our realities. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a wonderful afternoon with us. A round of applause for our audience. Thank you, thank you very much. In fact, I will request for a standing ovation for these wonderful audiences. I mean, my, my wonderful panelists, please. Please, thank you.